see if we're live. Hi, you all. Okay. We're live, I think. Okay, I'm going to YouTube to double check that we're actually live. My channel. Oh yeah, I can hear me talking to me. All right, nice. Hi everyone, oh wow, everyone's already here. We have folks from Germany. Typical Saturday night, it's already the night for some people. Hi Scott, Scott's here, yeah. Hello, Doc is here, hello. Hi everyone, so I, I actually, I'm gonna try to give people a few minutes before we jump in just so they can show up. I'm glad you guys can see and hear me. Awesome, hello. Yeah, from the Great Lakes. Yeah, everyone let me know where you're kind of watching, calling in, watching from. It's always super exciting. I'm always surprised by who is joining us at whatever hour it is during their time. <laughs> All hail Kanupra. What if I'm saying that wrong? I might be, Kanupra, I might be saying that wrong. That's how I say it in my head. So we'll just go with that for now. <laughs> Praise Memnon. <laughs> There's a war between the, uh, the fictional deities of our world going on. <laughs> Maritimes, let the heckling begin. Hashtag free the hammers. Oh my gosh, there's going to be a lot of really great inside Discord jokes in here. So if you want to know what they are, you should probably join my Discord. <laughs> Perfectly human. Awesome. Um, I think we'll give people like one more minute to jump in here. Did I have coffee? I had too much coffee this morning. I had so much coffee that my mouth was working faster than my brain and it wasn't good, but I, I ate some ramen and that brought my levels back into alignment. All that salt just fixed me. So yes, I'm back to normal now. Um, ooh, D, D, the big D, hey Paul. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to see you. Everyone's here. Completely lost already. <laughs> good, good, good. That's the, I, I'm almost that way too. So many inside jokes that it's, um, you know, there's another one that we're about to introduce here. Um, I think that we'll probably, we'll get started. So this is our second video in this series about how to write a fifth edition adventure, a one shot. And last time we had talked about um, how to generate the ideas that you're gonna be using. And I'm gonna pull that up and do a little recap of that as we get started. And I have some notes for you guys. I'll be taking notes live and then I'll leave a download link for those notes down below so you can have a copy of them. And I'm probably gonna talk about a couple different tools that I use um, you know, for like helping brainstorm um, encounter ideas. And I'll, I'll leave links to those as well, but they're all created by people smarter than me. So I'm just working off of their genius. Um, and here we go. We're going to start this by cracking a lacrosse live on camera. <laughs> what if it explodes? This is what I'm going to be drinking slash choking on. Did you hear the hiss of the bubbles? I hope you did. Cheers. Mm -hmm. When I can't come up with an idea on the fly, I'll just start sipping that. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to be working on an adventure that I have tried my best not to think about in the intervening time because I want to come up with ideas with you guys live. And as much as I don't like struggling, you're probably going to see me struggle. And I hope that that shows you that even someone who does this a lot, um, isn't always, you know, it doesn't just come out easily always. So... <laughs> So here we go. I'm going to switch over to a different screen. How, how does that look to you guys? Can you see the notes okay that we're about to start using? I hope you can. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Let me know if these notes become obscure at any time where you can't see them. Um, and I hope, that, I hope that I don't cover them up like I did last time. So um, here we go. How to outline your adventure. Let's jump in. So just recapping from our last video, which is in the playlist before this one, um, we had settled upon the name Bone Pavilion of the Shadowhounds, and we got that name by using the Tome of Adventure Design. 
a book that ought to be the textbook taught in all adventure writing classrooms. It's by Matt Finch. Um, you can grab it on Drive Through RPG or I think through the Frog God Games website. I believe that they are the ones selling this book. And it's invaluable. It's so good. It applies to so many different types of um, fantasy fiction. It, it's a treatise on the, the process of creativity. It's not just roll tables. It's talking about the process of creativity in a way that's so helpful. So I would strongly encourage adventure writers to grab a copy of this book, even just for the roll tables, let alone all the other advice. So we came up with this title, Bone Pavilion of the Shadowhounds. And last time we also talked about um, the importance of the hook. And we decided on a hook that gave us a really urgent problem um, that connected to the PCs. So we decided that the Shadowhounds are growing in number and audacity. So we know we have a bad guy we know we, they're up to something that the characters are going to need to solve. Beyond that, we don't know a lot. So the goal and the problem here is to find out why the Shadow Hounds are growing numerous and to stop them before they cause trouble. So let's see here. Pavilion is giving you mall vibes. I know, no, I thought that too. I almost, we almost didn't go with Pavilion, actually. We were considering a different word there. Oh, hey, Dason. Oh, man. Um... So, also from the last one, you saw that we had um, this preliminary outline. So, if you guys can see, I'm going to scroll us a little bit. We decided we were going to have this adventure run for three to five hours, which is about one sitting, so that's good for a one-shot. And we're assuming each encounter is going to take an average of 30 minutes, so we'll need between six and eight, including the opening of the adventure and the very end, which is like the aftermath portion. So, you see, we have a lot of question marks here for what's gonna happen from the start to the end. And this is what we're gonna fill in today. So, what I would recommend we do first is we have to consider the ending. So, you see number seven there, the aftermath is after the ending, but we need to think, what are we working toward? So, we have to come up with, with an idea for what's gonna really be the final encounter here. Um, because outlining is kind of the process of coming up with hurdles that when the characters overcome them, it moves them closer to that final encounter. Um, in 5th edition D&D in particular, this is a really classic approach to sort of a story-driven um, adventure. And story-driven adventures or goal-driven adventures are not the only kind that exist, but they're very common. And so that's why we're doing this, where we present a problem that the players are trying to solve. Um, so again, there are different types of adventures for sure. There are exploration adventures. Um, there are purely like social negotiation style adventures, but this format is pretty common, which is why we're focusing on it. So let us come up with a, an idea for a final encounter for our adventure. And I don't know what you guys are thinking, but my my instinct with this is I, I do like kind of boss fights. I think that they're really satisfying. Um, and so I'm inclined to make this a, a final combat of some kind. Um, I'm seeing in the comments here a fiendish hound master who is turning regular dogs into shadow mastiffs and hellhounds for his infernal masters. That's really great. Or <laughs> Doc mentioned the option of cuddling the puppies. <laughs> Oh, uh, no worries. Um, oh, thanks for stopping in. All right. Um, we've got someone leaving. That's okay. There will be a record of this on YouTube. I will post this afterwards. So, yes. I think, first of all, this is just some insight gathered from writing many boss encounters in my time. I, I think that solo monster fights are not always that satisfying for the characters, for the players. Um, not because they can't be cool, they certainly can, and I have written solo monster final encounters, but they're not that dynamic of a combat because you basically have the one creature and you have the characters pile driving the creature the best that they can and surrounding it, and especially at lower levels when you're like not really going to be having flying or anything too complex like that. Uh, it's, it's usually kind of just like a, what do they call that? Like a Oh, I can't remember, there's a word for it, where you just surround it and, and obliterate it. Um, surround and pound or something. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to be misconstrued instantaneously. So 
let's think of an encounter, a final encounter that includes multiple combatants. And I really like what Diablo, also known as Tath, is suggesting, which is having like multiple creatures, some of whom are the shadow hounds, most definitely. So I'm in this final little bit here, I'm gonna just make a quick note. We're gonna say like fight with shadow hounds plus um, maybe like evil handler. We don't know yet. Maybe there's a human involved or a, a, an intelligent person involved in this. So we have a general idea of what our final encounter is also going to be. Now I'm immediately going to do something here that I love doing. Um, I'm gonna write combat right there at the end in parentheses. And you'll see why I do this when I'm outlining. Um, but we now know the, the direction in which we're moving. So the intervening encounters need to take us from the hook towards this final combat. And I think a, an important thing we're gonna now talk about is, oh, it's ground and pound. Okay. <laughs> but what, what I wanna talk about is a concept about adventure design, and I'm sure I didn't come up with this myself, but maybe I'm putting a name to it that no one has heard before, that would be special. Um, when I'm writing these kinds of adventures, I like to use something called a cadence-based design. So if you've ever heard of a five-room dungeon, you, you might have tried to design one before or read about them, and what's special about those is a five-room dungeon is a concept for writing a short dungeon, a concept created by a designer named John Four. And it's about how to create a variety of different encounters to encompass one game night. Because, and this might've happened to you, you might've experienced this either as a player or a dungeon master, that you don't want a, a gaming session to just be all combat or like all talking, you know? So what's important is that there's a cadence to this, to what you're going to be experiencing as you go through this adventure. Um, and so, this is, this is a way to sort of create natural pacing and to keep the variety healthy throughout your adventure because you just don't want the same stuff back to back. So we're gonna talk about how to insert the three kind of different encounter types, broadly speaking, into this adventure. We have combat as one type, we have NPC interaction, and we have exploration. So I'm actually gonna put that in our notes here. So we have three encounter types we have combat, BC interaction, and exploration, which that, that can include things like puzzles, traps, and navigation. I guess I don't know why I bolded them, but you know, or capitalized them, but you know, you'll I'm sure you'll forgive me. So we want to make sure now, as we go through the rest of this outline, that we're never really having too much of the same stuff back to back. So that's actually why in the seventh encounter I wrote combat at the end, because we want to be able to glance through this and make sure that we don't have a bunch of combats all in a row. And you might also be wondering now at this point, well, how do we know what order the adventurers are going to take the, the adventure? Like, how do we know? We, the, the whole, we don't want to force a certain order of encounters on the players because that would be kind of like boring and so that would be kind of like the classic concept of a railroad. Um, and my, my answer to that is that we don't actually know necessarily the exact path that they're going to take through whatever dungeon or whatever we design. We don't really know. We can assume a likely path and that's what we're going to do. We are going to assume that there's a typical path that the characters are going to take and we're going to design this so that even if they don't take the typical path, there's still a cadence. Like there's still not gonna be too many pot in encounters of the same type next to each other, no matter which way they go. So why don't we jump in then? Let's get started here. All right, we have to think about what we wanna do. I think a, a place that I often start when I don't have a ton of immediate ideas is um, I start to think about what do the four major class types want? Um, by that I mean, what does a cleric want to do in an adventure? What does a fighter want to do? And a rogue and a wizard. So I know that there are way more classes than that in 5th edition, like way more. However, those are like the four archetypes. So you want to kind of design assuming that there's roughly one of each like flavor of character of that type. 
And then you really want to think about how can I create an encounter that will favor at least one of that character type during the adventure. So let's start there. Let's bust open the notes. And I think I'm going to have us first come up with um, cleric. So what's something fun a cleric could do? Rogue and wizard. Okay. Huh. So bone pavilion. I mean, that immediately makes me think at least of some form of undead. Um, which clerics love. So maybe we should, maybe we should put something about undead in here. Bones? <laughs> the bone pavilion. What do you guys think? A bone pavilion? Like to me, that sounds like an ancient place that is, it maybe has undead in it. It certainly has some kind of like esoteric or, um, kind of mysterious dark magic vibe to it. So I think we should lean into that. I think we should make the bones a very powerful part of this. So clerics are there. Yes, clerics are there to heal and they're there to turn on debt and they're there to offer buffs, generally speaking. So I think an encounter that we should consider that would definitely make a cleric feel cool is a, a fight with skeletons. Um, the chance to identify religious iconography. What are some other ideas? Like, what do you guys think that a cleric does to that would be something that makes them feel like they did a cool, a cool thing? Like, how often do you guys play clerics? I actually don't play clerics too often. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Scott, maybe it's made of skeletons. Ooh, that's a cool idea. Let's put that in. So should we say, like, um, door barrier made of skeletons that would be really neat Ooh, i love that in fact i think that would be a great first encounter um some kind of barrier made of skeletons that a cleric could be the linchpin for getting past now we have to make sure we don't make it so that only a cleric can get past but i think it'd be neat so let's kind of throw that on our outline so our first encounter would be skeleton skeleton door i suppose skeleton door so we're gonna call that um you know i don't think that's so much a combat i think that actually falls more into like the exploration slash puzzle category so we'll call this like um a puzzle but not an explicit one like a puzzle in the in the nature of like how do we get past this um, you know, I've never been a big lover of explicit puzzles. I know some DMs are, um, and like totally cool, but I don't like writing like a solve the anagram type thing. I like making a puzzle more about like, how can they creatively bypass this hurdle, this barrier that, that is preventing them from moving forward in the adventure. So, oh, I see some really cool ideas here in the chat. Um, personal stake if the DD had, oh yeah, if the grounds are like profane, yeah, totally. I'm absolutely getting a vibe of like evil religious or like druidic type stuff. So we'll put that here, evil religious druidic magic. Awesome. Okay. Well, and there we go. We've already come up with a, an encounter which we could shift around. Um, ancient dog worshiping cult whose sacred place has been corrupted. Nice. I love that. That's a great idea too. So maybe that's why the Shadowhounds are getting upset. Something has corrupted their sacred ground. And that kind of ties into Tath's um, idea of maybe like an evil handler. So we're actually getting close to some more concepts. And see, see how like these ideas as we come up with them start to weave the adventure together. We didn't really have this idea of this evil handler fully fleshed out, but now we're thinking, oh, hey, that'd be cool if we move in that direction. It explains why some bad things are happening. So let's note that down. Evil handler um, who angered the hounds. Maybe I should say upset so it all fits on one line. Nope. We'll just say bad guy. Upset the hounds. I don't know. Okay, fine. It doesn't all fit. Um, all right. So... Let's think of some more encounters. We don't have that many because we're only going to be able to fit through like, you know, six to eight encounters in this. But 
let's think of something that fighters like to do. What do you guys say? What do fighters like to do, you guys? <laughs> um, it's kind of a loaded question. Obviously, fighters excel at combat. Um, but don't also forget that fighters tend to be the strength-based character, so that actually gives them some advantages in environmental exploration. They're the best at bashing down doors or the best at, at athletics, like jumping over barriers. Um, they can grapple, you know. So let's, let's consider, since we don't want too many combats, we can't have that many because we can't have all of the same stuff in here. What else can fighters do? Let's challenge ourselves to think of this. What do you guys think? Let me see the chats. Mm. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> fighters play chess. I know. <laughs> fighters. Mm. Fighters and shadow hounds. Bone pavilions. How can we make this cool? They're good at strength checks. That's true. They're usually very good at athletics. So what if we... So what if we create a situation in which the fighter has to use their superior strength-based skills and ability scores to impact the environment? They don't get to do that as often as they get to fight, so it's nice to emphasize something kind of um, unique. So let's say something like um, a barricade or, oh, like a pit, like a, um, yeah, a pit trap. Yeah, some kind of, some kind of barrier that requires strength usually in the form of athletics to overcome. Hmm. I like that. So what I'm thinking is maybe the, the bone pavilion. Okay, so my thought here, there's a bone pavilion and it's above ground and it's in the swampy marsh. We had talked about that last time. Mangroves everywhere and you can see the roots going down into the earth around this bone pavilion. In fact, I think it'd be really cool if it was in the shadow of some big sort of willowy mangrove tree. Um, and so we have this pavilion above ground. And I think our first encounter is gonna require getting past some skeletal barrier or barricade. Um, possibly could result in combat, but more likely it's gonna be about like turn undead or you know, smashing through them in such a way that they, it, maybe the, the wall will grab at them and try to throw them out and repel them. So we'll consider that less a combat and more just a barrier. And then yes, oh, the Slapicus, you, you read my mind. <laughs> I think that a really neat encounter might be some kind of spiked pit with bones as the spikes instead of, you know, uh, javelins. So I, I would typically we'd have either the rogue or the fighter trying to leap across because I'm assuming we're writing this for low levels. In fact, let's assume it's for first level. I should write that down. Um, we're gonna say first level, just because it's easy to for everybody. Everybody has played a first level adventure most likely, so it's easy to you know everyone to follow along with. So let's call this one the barricade of bones, or no, the the um, not the barricade the. The, the pit of bones, pit of bone spikes. Um, and we're gonna call this, you know, this is kind of more like a navigation slash trap. So we could set it up that the, the evil person who has upset the spirits of these shadow hounds um, maybe figured people would be after them at some point, so they set up sort of a rudimentary covered pit trap. So we'll say um, covered pit trap. And the first player, the first character in line is probably gonna trigger it and fall in. Have you guys ever experienced this where your character spent more time trying to get over a pit trap than they did in the final fight? Because that happens to me all the time. <laughs> so, so let's give them a good, a good trap. Um, with the jump, the jump rules and athletics, um, characters can jump pretty dang far with a running start. So we can either make this more challenging by denying a running start, or we can just make it pretty wide. So I would probably try to put this leap out of the range of low strength characters so that the fighter can kind of have the opportunity to shine here. So let's make it between 10 and, oh, see you doc, thanks for stopping in. All right. Oh, can you have a pit trap in a swamp? I bet you, I bet you probably, 
can. It'd be just muddy in the bottom, you know. I think lots of roots help stabilize the earth, you know, and keep it from washing out. And it's probably icky and muddy. So we'll use that as a cool descriptive feature. Um, let's write it down too. Write everything down, everything that you think of. Um, we're going to say, um, make it muddy. <laughs> All right, we've got our trap. I'm gonna say that the trap should be approximately 15 feet at widest point. Um, I, this is a situation in which I would go and look up the, the athletic and jump rules just to make sure, but it's gonna be between 10 and 15 feet so that a, um, a wizard isn't as likely to make the jump as a fighter or a rogue. We wanna let them shine for now. All right. Oh yeah, loose bones that make it harder. Oh yeah, ooh, there's probably some murky water. There might even be the chance of like disease if you get stabbed by these bones. I mean, insult to injury. Disease is really interesting. Um, so we'll say, uh, do do do, bone spike, bone pit of bone spikes. Um, possible disease. And that'll ooh, let's add that to the clerics like disease. Yeah, disease. They love healing it. Okay. Next, what do rogues like? Let's think of some rogue encounters. Um, snakes in the pit trap. Ooh, <laughs> let's just keep adding. Let's just have it be like spikes and then like disease and then like snakes fall in on top of you. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll have a way to do this. Um, yeah, quicksand. Quicksand is a good one. Quicksand's a good one. It's a barricade. You know what? Maybe we should incorporate some quicksand into the final fight. That's actually very exciting. Um, so we're gonna do, okay, we're gonna add in some quicksand, quicksand, that would make it very exciting and dynamic, very cool. Um, ooh, swamp vines, floating bones that turn out to be a gelatinous cube, that's actually really cool. Um, I, I love that idea, I feel like a gelatinous cube is a little punitive for first level characters, I know it's because I've done that before, and I've been, I've been, I've received some angry emails about how Parties got crushed by gelatinous cubes, so, um, mm, maybe we'll save that for the follow-up adventure, the gelatinous cube. All right, back to what rogues appreciate. Um, they obviously love traps, but disarming traps is kind of like perfunctory in my opinion. Rogues are like, I made a roll, cool, you know, and that's it. So rogues, I think some of the things that rogues like the best are um, sneaking, hiding, backs, uh, backstabbing, which is now called sneak attack. Um, you know what's funny? I am of the opinion, and I don't know if you all agree with me, that rogues are actually a combat class, much more than an exploration class. Um, I think wizards are the most pro-exploration class because they have environment affecting magic, but, um... I might be wrong. I don't know. You guys might think that this is um, not the not correct. Who is naked? <laughs> Someone be posting some spam in the chat. I'm gonna see if I can get rid of that. Ignore whoever this person is who's posting things about um, clothing things. Mm, mm, go away, please. All right, rogues. Now, we don't want our cadence to get too similar. See, we already have puzzles and navigations type things. So here's another thing. Yeah, we get our first bot. This is exciting. Cheers, bot. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, rogues also love social stuff. Mm. They, all, they have all kinds of um, skill proficiencies that allow them to get away with lying, intimidating, persuading. So um, what if we actually put an NPC in here? Someone who the rogue can lead an interaction with. So let me see here. So we'll put NPC. Um, doo -doo -doo. Now what kind of NPC would we find down here in the bone pavilion? I have a thought. This just came to me. I don't know if you guys would agree with this. Um, the bone pavilion is obviously a, a sacred or formerly sacred place. Um, and I wonder if maybe some fledgling druid came here to try to right wrongs and got in way over their head. Um, so my thought is that we have a druid character who 
may or may not be helpful to the adventurers depending on how they do this interaction. So <laughs> where are the mods when you need them? I don't know how to boot somebody from a chat, but I feel like they, they, they chilled out. So, okay, next encounter. Oh, by the way, I also like sometimes writing the, the, um, the class that's being emphasized here. So let's clean up our, let's clean up our outline. Navigation trap, and that's actually gonna be fighter. Um, let me bold these so that they're a bit easier to parse out for you all. I'm sure it's so exciting to watch me format a document. Um, okay. Puzzle. You know what, I just wanna clean this up for the sake of posterity here. Um, so that you guys find this easier to read and so do I. And then our idea here, so we're thinking NPC, NPC, and that's gonna be a um, captured, injured, maybe druid. Oh, I see a gravekeeper is an idea too. Um, yeah, rogues love gold. Yeah, maybe they're in the pit. Oh, that's a cool idea. Or maybe, you know what, maybe so that we can actually have some, because um, we need to have some space to move the characters along. Like I wanna create um, a little bit of, of room between each encounter. So as much as it'd be neat to have this druid in the pit, my instinct is to say we should probably place this druid in another location. Um, but maybe the druid got injured in the pit and got out. So we'll make sure to indicate a blood trail, which is showing the world to the characters without explaining it. Um, do, 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 we're gonna say blood trail. So NPC, so we'll say injured druid in over their head, and this is an NPC interaction, and this typically favors the rogue. Um, and do, 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 injured from pit trap. All right, so let me move us down here. I, I you know, it's not fun to have outlines on separate pages. We need to be able to look at this all together. All right, another pit. I know that'd be so mean. <laughs> another pit. Um, okay, we're approaching the end here already. So here's the deal. Our next step, I want to let, I want to let the chat guess for a second based on some of the concepts we just talked about previously. Our next encounter in the, in the anticipated path here. Um, I think there's a right answer for what that ought to be based on the cadence based design structure we're using where we don't want too much of the same stuff next to each other. So looking at our outline here, here we have this kind of encounter. We have this kind of encounter. Um, we have do, do, do this kind of encounter. We have this kind. So what do you think this next one ought to be based on our desire for some cadence? I'm gonna give the chat like five, f a, a, a long lacrosse sip to post your opinions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see a trap potentially. Now I'm not saying I'm right in my belief here, by the way, but I'm curious if you guys think what you think the rib cage <laughs> The ribs of the cage start imploding, possibly. I am, oh, hello from Wisconsin. I used, I'm from there. Greetings, Heather. Um, so glad to have you here. A fellow Wisconsinite, let me, oh, hey, Julio, I'm glad to have you here too. Um, I personally think that this is around the time that we have our second combat. Rando, you read my mind again. I might be a little behind the chat, but what I'm seeing here is Rando just suggested a combat but to use up combat resources right before the boss fight. That's right on the money, in my opinion. For the classical structure we're using here, we don't want the next encounter to be a combat because that would be right before the boss fight. So to preserve the cadence, we want to make sure we don't do that, and this is the right time for a combat. This is how we keep our pacing healthy. So we need to have some kind of a combat. And who haven't we featured yet? Well, it's the wizard. 
And this is an interesting thing. What are wizards good at? I saw um, DP say deciphering arcane text. Absolutely true. They, they're they excellent at that. Yep, Scott, you are right. A minor combat. I agree with all of you. You, you guys are you're following along like pros here. I, I'm going to ask you all to write my adventures after this. I can stop now. Um, so a wizard is good at stuff in combat. Wizards are really interesting classes because they're some of the best in the environment. Um, especially as they gain levels and they like get access to the fly spell and like all those kinds of wall type spells and you know teleportation um, misty step all that but they're so good at combat of a particular nature and do you guys know what that kind is i see crowd control yes they are they're excellent at crowd control that's what they're built for in combat so i think that we should feature that for the wizard crowd control fight for sure um and yes a, an, an encounter with the shadow hounds or some kind of like precursor this is again i think that your the chat's instincts are right here because i'm seeing people talking about tying this into the shadow hounds and i think that we it's like required that we do that because they're the theme of this adventure besides the bone pavilion situation so um i would envision us maybe going further underground and how can we feature the shadow hounds without making it too much the same as the last fight will be um how can we do this now here's a few ideas monster variety so maybe there's more than one kind of shadow hound maybe the shadow hounds themselves have different specialties so my thought is, oh yeah, I wish 5e had minions in the chat. I know that because that's what I'm thinking, like a sort of minion style fight where you have a bunch of weak opponents um, that are swarmy, but they, they can get taken out very easily with area of effect. Um, yeah, not all wizards are built. Yeah, crowd control or AoE. I think that burning hands and magic missile are pretty typical choices for a first level wizard. And that's not always the case, so we won't lay it on too hard, but we'll offer the chance for some crowd control stuff here. I I think that we should have, yeah, like shadow puppies. Yeah, shadow puppies are like the, the beta dogs. These are not the alpha shadow wolves yet. Those guys are hanging out with the boss. We have sort of the scrappy pack, the, the non-ripped ones, you know, the regular guys. So, um, oh, interesting. So yes, so I'm seeing Taff, aka Diablo in our chat, a corrupted altar of the Hound God protected by magic or bone dogs. Yeah, like why don't we use this opportunity to also convey some story? So why don't we make this combat a swarmy situation where the, the hounds are surrounding like an altar and the characters can see that there's something amiss with the altar but they won't really they won't really be able to figure out what it is until they're able to get close so they'll have to fight through and defeat these hounds and then once they get to the altar they'll see that it's been corrupted in some way that isn't easy to fix you know they can't just wave their hands over it and fix it and boom the adventure's done like it's been cloven in two with a streak of blood over it or like the body of like a dead um fairy that blood was required to destroy this altar so let's do that I like that idea a lot. We're going to do a um, fight with lesser hounds around Shattered Altar. Um, great. And this is a combat that features the wizard. Um, I'm going to make sure I put in AoE so we remember that that's the goal of this combat. All right. Cool. Swarm tactics, yeah, swarm tactics are really dangerous for a lot of character types. Um, yeah, I like this idea too. The hounds are not chained and the PCs might not realize it's freeing. The hounds will actually avoid the combat. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, is there a way to lessen or avoid this combat? I kind of, you know, I kind of think that the shadow hounds have been roaming free. Um, which is the inst one of the instigating parts of this adventure. So I don't want to necessarily chain them because then how can they run free and cause mayhem? But maybe 
Is there a way to like appease the hound somewhat or you know what? How like, maybe the altar can be a key factor here. Like maybe if the hounds are super swarmy and attacky, it's because they're enraged about the altar. And if a cleric or maybe a spellcaster passes some kind of magic oriented check or casts a spell into the altar, maybe it can actually calm down or appease these hounds somewhat. So we'll work that in when we actually develop out this combat. I really like that idea. So um, AOE, and then we'll say that, um, you know, some like, like trying to um, repair or re-bless the altar um, appeases the hounds. I think that might be really cool. Like, maybe they can't necessarily totally fix the corruption. Like, perhaps that's only possible after defeating the bad guy. Maybe he has, like, a component that they need to replace. Um, or the, pa the lead dog is still being held to his will and the other hounds can't actually break this um, corrupted situation until the, the alpha hound is also freed. So, yes, that's really neat. I like that. There's an extra dimension to this combat. Now, we have one more encounter to outline. And at this point, we've hit all the different character classes. We've hit two combats, which I think is the right amount for a one-shot. I don't think it more than that is good. It can get too grindy. So that leaves us with an option for either more... Well, let's look at our list again. Mm-hmm. We could either do combat, NPC interaction, or an exploration challenge. Um, tummy rubs, <laughs> shadow stakes, <laughs> how to appease them. Um, yeah, would the cleric be stealing the spotlight from the wizard? Possibly. However, with the number of encounters that we have in here, there is going to be one character who probably gets featured a little more than the other, you know? Um... So that's not necessarily bad. I still think that the wizard, between the wizard and the cleric, their knowledge of magic will be what the key component is for this altar situation. Um, and we can even write it in such a way that we can give it to either class depending on who the, the DM feels is the right choice in the moment. Um, and so I'm, it's a good thought, Scott, but I think, I think we're okay. I don't think any class is too heavily featured. But we just gave a fight. A fight is great for um, fighters and rogues as well. They love that. That's their bread and butter. So this is a tough one. The last encounter is actually kind of a tough one. Like, what do we want to feature? We already had a pit trap. We kind of had a puzzle. Um, navigation? Navigation's tricky. That's like getting lost in an area and trying to get through it. Like... Maybe that would be the right choice. Like something to really break up the momentum and really kind of ease off of the combat since we know we're going into another one right away. Like, yeah, like the last one, I agree with Michael in the chat, the last one before the boss should be some form of exploration that kind of gives the characters like a breather in a way um, and like lowers the pacing a little bit so that it'll feel higher when they get back to this final combat. Um... And exploration is always a good way to, um, to convey some story as well. Like, take every opportunity that you can to convey story in your encounters by demonstrating um, what's going on, by, by showing it. And I know people say show, don't tell, but what that, I, I, when I heard that as a, as a fledgling writer, I would always be like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, of course, everything I'm writing involves the characters seeing it in some way, but what we mean is that like you're not telling the characters explicitly what's going on you're you're making sure that the remnants of that of those um situations or that the the aftermath effects of what's going on here are visible to them so an example of that would have been um the broken altar you know that that we didn't have someone say hey the evil guy broke that altar we showed them and in fact we probably have like a dead body on it like of a fairy or something oh my god bot go away <laughs> there's a terrible bot in our chat how do i make it go away i'll figure that out for next time um yeah all right so getting back to the thought here 
we want to give an exploration thing. And my, my initial thought here is some kind of like, I mean, we're, we're like mangrove maze type situation. We have this going on. We're underground and there are mangroves up above. Um, maybe there's some kind of sacred room. <laughs> the bots are multiplying. Like this was an altar room, but maybe there's also some kind of sacred room. Like here's, when we're thinking about esoteric things and all the different rooms that, that are associated with religious stuff, um, sometimes it helps to contextualize this with religious traditions that you might know, that you might be familiar with. Like, um, like in a, in a Western style, like, you know, Christian church, you have different rooms that each would be used for a different purpose. So you have like an altar area, you have areas for prayer, you have um, areas for the staff to live, you have um, areas where the treasure is stored. So my thought here is we've had an altar room. Why don't we create some kind of um, like offering room? Because I get the sense that this, this bone pavilion was like a site of worship and a place where people would come maybe to leave offerings to the shadow hounds who are guardian type creatures until they get mad. So why don't we create an offering room that maybe is difficult to get to? Like there's some like environmental and hazard type things that the characters have to negotiate in order to get there. And then when they get there, they're gonna see more evidence of what these hounds meant to the people who worshiped them. So, oh yeah, the rectory. So um, this one, this one I probably have is still the foggiest in my mind. So we're gonna say like some kind of navigation to offering room. And my thoughts here are like, we wanna incorporate like mangroves, we're underground, it's muddy. Um, we don't really wanna reduce this to just a bunch of like ability checks because what's more fun is for the characters to come up with clever ways to get around a barricade that isn't simply rolling high on a die. So, um, I, I, pit traps are always a great thing, but, and I know we wanted to save quicksand for the last encounter. I think that would be really exciting. So I don't want to, I don't want to reveal the quicksand hand too early. Hmm. Maybe we can create something of a, like of a mangrove maze. Um, which is like a bunch of twisty passages. And so the characters can choose which direction to go. Um, and they'll all eventually dump out into the same room, but the different passageways each have something that, that provides, that creates a different form of challenge. You know, like one passageway might be like the grasping hands of skeletal dead in the walls. And then another passageway might be like a thick tangle of poisonous vines that they have to pick through. And then maybe the third passageway could be like mind jarring runes of like warding and magic that they have to resist as they go through. And clever characters will sort of investigate each path a little bit and then decide what the right route is for them. So yeah, like a mushroom maze with shriekers, really good one. Oh, thanks for stopping in, Tath. I know it's late for you. We'll, we'll get you the rest later on. <laughs> Bring hammers. <laughs> I'll explain that inside joke someday. Um, yeah, there's like a room that shows the hounds used to be protectors, but they're only, oh yeah, but they're only recently corrupted. Mm-hmm, this is all smart. Um, starting a fire using a light spell because it's within the ability of any character. Yeah, and it ties into the light and shadow themes. Mm hmm. I, I think they'll probably have needed a light source throughout this. Um, so it is kind of implied. It is kind of implied. Um, but yes, I, I, there are some themes of light and darkness here. So let's just throw down some quick ideas. We can always refine this as we get into the actual writing, which is going to be probably the next the next live stream where I'm actually going to write a, like some sections of this adventure to show you guys how we do that and how we take an outline and convert it into text that a dungeon master can use that tries to convey evocative imagery and um, how we use some game design techniques to create an interactive environment for the characters. Interaction is the core of adventure role-playing games. So I'm gonna write down our quick ideas here. Um, navigation, um, we're gonna say like maybe, so we'll say like, 
um, three paths, each of a different challenge. And we want to try to convey story. So we might say like um, grabbing undead, that, that whisper, prayers, secrets. Maybe they're not necessarily harmful, um, but they kind of are scary and they slow you down. Um, then let's do, we had maybe like toxic, toxic vines, mangrove roots, mangrove roots. I don't know, like that one might be shoehorned in a bit. Like what purpose do those serve? Maybe is a, maybe, honestly, maybe the mangrove roots serve as a protective barrier to keep the offering safe. And that if the characters know the right things to say or they offer worship to the shadow house, maybe the roots retract and let them through. So, um, toxic mangrove roots that retract if prayer offering given to shadow hounds. And then the third one might have been, what was I thinking? It might have been like runes or runes or like pictographic type things that show like, you know how a lot of churches have art that tells the story of the religion? Maybe this is that hallway. So this is the hall that shows, um, depictions of you know depictions of um shadow hound worship um but has like glyphs or traps um for the unfaithful unworthy so maybe if the characters don't take the right actions in this room um it can actually cause a magical trap or problem to trigger so this last one's pretty large here. Um, let me see, what can I emphasize here? Uh, navigation, I think we kind of have that. Let me see. Um, I'm just gonna call this one an exploration style situation. And this is great because giving the three options gives the characters a chance to sort of, um, like I said, maybe do a bit of recon and see which path they feel they can overcome most easily. Or maybe characters will split up from each other because one is like, well, I'm good at dodging. I'm going to go down the vine path. And another one's like, well, I'm very good at, you know, wisdom saves. So I'm going to go down the mind numbing ruin magic one. So yeah, the hall of exposition. I know exactly. Um, yes, there's always going to be a, a, a room or some feature that explains the situation a little bit. And you know, it's a lot of times for exposition, like when you're trying to explain the story, a lot of times, and I myself am guilty of this, a lot of people will fall back on like the diary of the villain or something, or like an NPC who just explains it all. And that's not necessarily bad. I've done all of those things, but I, I think that, um, it's easy for it to become a crutch or a way that you should convey information like all the time. So trying to think outside of those um, those ways of giving exposition um, are gonna maybe lead you down more interesting paths. So, mm -hmm. so you all, I think we have a pretty solid outline here. Pretty solid outline. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this bold. Oops. And then of course we have our aftermath. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna bold our keywords here because when when do I not do that? <laughs> okay. So this was almost exactly an hour. I want to show you all one more thing, kind of as a final little bonus here. Um, and then we're gonna get into next time talking about actually writing these ideas out into the real deal. Um, oops, I accidentally bolded this whole dang thing. All right, I don't know what I did. Um, maybe if I just do that now, nah, whatever. Um, so. I want to show you guys, I actually like to put this all together in the last couple of minutes we have. Um, I actually grabbed the um, encounter notes. This is the actual set of notes that I wrote for Ghostlight, um, which is a first level adventure I published, uh, I think last year, no, earlier this year. Um, and this is the actual outline I wrote for that in my notes. So I just copied and pasted it here or screenshot it here. Um, and you can see that at least for me, this, this outlining style really works for me where I try to write a, a, a quick note about the encounter that I envision. And then at the end, I'll write down the type of encounter it is so I can glance through and make sure that we have a cadence. Um, and so I will include this for you guys to check out in, my, in, my, in the notes if you want. And if you, if you have Ghostlight or even if you just watch the video walkthrough of Ghostlight that I had, you'll see me explain how I converted each of these 
you know, encounters into the written part of the adventure. So like, this is an actual look at my notes for writing. And that's it. Do you guys, we have a couple minutes left. Does anyone have any questions about what we went over or some ideas? Is anyone gonna actually try to write this for themselves and then we can compare notes? I know that there's one person who did. They emailed me that they actually wrote an entire adventure already. And I, I didn't read it because I didn't want it to influence what we would talk about here, but I'm looking forward to reading it after the series is done. So no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. Rangdo, are you gonna try to write this out? You're gonna make your own version? I think that'd be really cool. I think it'd be neat if we saw how people approached this. Um, and if you if you want, um, you know, let me let me actually consider for the next stream. We might actually focus more on mapping than we do on the actual writing bit, because mapping is a little bit complicated and important. And um, eventually, we're gonna get to uh, the more nuanced things about encounter design. Um, yes, DP is asking about treasure. That's a good thought too. Treasure is um, kind of baked into the encounter design aspect. It's it's gonna definitely be something we talk about. Um, recommended treasure for this level. What kinds of treasure is cool? I'm sure that you guys are already thinking about some neat treasures inspired by this adventure. I know I am, so we'll see what we come up with, but. Just regular old gold is not as fun as themed stuff. So, all right, our next stream is probably going to take place in early December or, you know, in the next few weeks. I know we have an American holiday coming up, Thanksgiving. I am getting a puppy in three days, so my life might be a little crazy. My wife and my life, you see, there's her crate right there. I don't know if you can see, that's a new feature. My white couch, which some of you all mentioned to me after the fact in the last live stream, this is the last time it will probably be white because now we're gonna have a puppy. So we'll see how that goes. And I, I'm hoping we'll talk again um, late November, early December about our next steps for this one. Pending puppy mayhem, but I'm pretty confident we'll be okay. And if you want, jump in my Discord server because we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. And then you'll be in the know and most up to date about when we're actually gonna do this and your vote about when exactly we do it will be able to be taken into account based on your availability. Um, and I also have a newsletter and if you want articles that talk about all kinds of stuff about D&D game design and a free adventure, um, jump, on my, jump on my newsletter. So I'll leave a link to that down below. And I really appreciate you all watching through this whole thing. So that's gonna be it for now. Uh, and I really am excited to keep working on this. All right, everyone, I will catch you next time.